this I think is the sleeper hit of this particular release. Everybody is talking about it and all the cool kids want one for their layout. Hey there Midorks, it's great to see you and welcome along to another video here with me Jenny Kirk and today we have got a review of a model. They've just come through actually the second wave of these from Daypol and yes you've guessed it it's going to be the B4 dock tank and also stay tuned to the end of the video if you really want a helpful guide on how to DCC fit these models and that DCC fitting is in conjunction with Train-O-Matic makers of the best DCC decoders that money can buy and also today I'd like to say a big big thank you to this video being in association with Rails of Sheffield and in particular their wanted service. This is a service that allows you to trade in unwanted items of locomotives and rolling stock and get the best possible price for them either for cash or for store credit to put towards something that you really really want. It couldn't be simpler. Follow the links down below and when you do tell them that Jenny Kirk sent you and you'll get a 10% up lift on your agreed valuation right through until the end of June 2020. So hurry and take advantage today. But without further ado, let's head on in and take a closer look. Here's today's model and it's a Daypole London and South Western Railway B4 class locomotive. It's the dock tanks. Now these locomotives are probably most famous for their work in Southampton docks and they ran there for a good length of time right up until they were replaced by the USA dock tanks which in turn were replaced by the class 7 diesel shunters. Uh, but um, these particular locomotives Daypole have already brought them out before. I did have one from the previous batch which was London and South Western Railway number 91 in that really beautiful pea green and um, I was really looking forward to this next release because there were a number that have caught my eye uh, and it was actually Sussex in that very vibrant yellow colour was the locomotive which I was going to order and what was interesting was actually this particular one passed under the radar until I saw actual photographs of the model and it is 4S018007 B4040 tank Guernsey in dark green lined. Now that doesn't really tell you an awful lot about this model until we get it out of the box. And uh, this, I think, is the sleeper hit of this particular release. Everybody is talking about it, and all the cool kids want one for their layout. But first of all, it comes with this lovely, actually well-presented owner's manual, uh, which I just think is a really nice touch. It's presented as a, a very well-put-together booklet, which gives you a lot of information about how the locomotive is put together. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in association with Trainomatic. We're going to do a DCC fitting guide for these but um, there as well if you should need any spare parts this gives you literally a full breakdown of the entire model uh, and uh, the ability to get any parts that you need um, there's a lot of information in here so that is really nice to see that they've they've really comprehensively got you covered on that inside the box and it's pretty well packaged actually it's another area that Daypol do well is very substantial boxes which stops these models from getting damaged in transit and I always say that you know it, it, it becomes a bit of um, derision on YouTube reviewers when they spend half an hour on the box and you're thinking what's in the box that's what I came for but really it does ooze quality these boxes and um, you know it's the little touches like that that really make a model now uh, I'm just going to show you in this little extras bag these are very peculiar little couplings actually I'm not entirely sure what these are and I'm sure it'll be pointed out to me in the comments but they come with these alternatives that plug into the NEM pockets and they've got this very very wide sort of like D uh, shape um, goal post for want of a better word. I'm not entirely sure 
what you would use these for, or why Daypol have decided that these are the must-include couplings. But I've never seen these with anything else. The model itself, once we get down through all of the blister pack, um, is held quite snugly inside there. And then there it is. This is the model that really did sell me. It's it's just beautiful, really is just beautiful. And this lined leaf green really does set these diminutive locomotives off so, so well. Now, the locomotives that went to Southampton docks were all named after ports that the, the services from those docks served. So places like Guernsey, um, but then also further afield as well. There was um, quite a lot of ports like St. Marlo in France, places like that, Cherbourg, all the way down that part of France, uh, places in Germany as well. And it was really a celebration of the services that were running from Southampton docks at the time. Guernsey was delivered, I believe, new to the docks, never carried a number at the time. So this is an actual London and South Western Railway livery, I believe. But um, the, the dock locomotives just had this very unique way of being presented. Uh, the actual green here is very different from the pea green that we've seen uh, number 91 in the previous batch in. It's much, much darker. Now that pea green matched things like the uh, T9 that Hornby have done, the M7 that Hornby have done. But this, I've never seen anything quite like it. And I'm inclined to believe that this type of green was more unique to the dock locomotives. They weren't all the same colour. Uh, in the previous batch, Kane, Khan, Kane, I think it's spelt C-A-E-N, was presented in a kind of um, chocolatey brown colour, and that was another one of the Southampton Docks locomotives. What really makes this locomotive stand apart from the previous releases is this cab. And you can see that these were cut right away to aid with visibility. And in model form, that does make them very, very different. It's nice to see that Daypol have tooled up for the different cab options. And there is actually, I think I counted three different iterations of the cab that are available. But this is probably the most eye-catching one. And the best thing in model form about this really extensively cut away cab is just how much detail it now allows us to see inside the cab. All of the back head details that you see in there are actually standard across the range. So even if you buy one of the others, this fabulous detail is in there. It's just this allows you to see it so, so well. If I turn to the back of the cab, it's quite interesting. It's not just a standard circular or semicircular cutaway. If you look to this side, it's actually quite a complex shape. And the reason for this is to accommodate the handbrake standard there so that when the uh, crew were winding it on and off, they had enough clearance. And from memory, I think that the previous versions with the fully enclosed cabs have a kind of a cutout there to accommodate that. So it's really nice to see just how much attention to the, the, the small details Daypole have gone to. We've also got that centre porthole type uh, window in there and the glazing is absolutely flush. And now I'm going to turn it over and just look inside the cab. There's no actual glazing bar across the back there. The, the glazing is the porthole. That's all it is. And it really does work so, so well. With a cab with such big side cutaways like this, there really is no other way of actually getting that uh, uh, to look perfect without doing it properly. If you had some kind of clear glazing bar across the back, it just wouldn't work because it would be far too obvious. And that really is a nice plus point. If I turn the cab over and we see the back head details, again, that porthole there is done in exactly the same way. It really is, I've got this under a light here, and you can see all of the separately applied pipework, the gauges, everything is in there. I could spend ages just looking at this. It really is a work of art. So I'm just going to try and show you that. That really is exquisite in there. It really honestly is. 
The cab itself has other embellishments. So we've got this kind of handrail that goes all the way up on both sides, just as per the uh, originals. And then on the front, we've also got these stays that go down onto the tank to steady the cab and stop it from, I suppose, being able to flap about uh, because there's so much metal that was removed on the sides. So it just is lovely that Daypol have not only tooled up this far more intricate variation, but they do appear to have got it pretty much correct. If we look to the tank sides, we've got these, um, I think they're either toolboxes or sandboxes, uh, but they are a separately applied piece. And the paint finish, you can see there, the exquisite tampo printing on the lining. Though actually I got into trouble with that in the Pico video with the bug box coaches. Uh, Pico actually uh, wrote to me to say, thanks for the review, just one note. Uh, we don't use tampo printing, we use um, something else which is like the next stage on. So I believe that manufacturers have uh, moved on from tampo printing and have a much more refined process that is kind of the next stage in the development of the technology. I can't remember what it's called. So uh, I just leave a note here. When I say tampo printing, that's just become a colloquialism for putting all the lining and stuff on because it just makes it easier for me. So uh, the cupboard monkey as well has just said to me that uh, she's a bit disappointed that it means that they're not just cutting out shapes from a potato and then squidging it on the sides there. So I think we've we've long since gone past that. But this uh, lining application really is straight and true. And the colours on here, there's like a, a green and I'm also seeming to detect like a hint of yellow as well. So it'd be interesting to see under very, very close magnification whether there actually are two different colours on that. Uh, but, you know, the caveat here is even when I get my um, slightly worn out middle aged eyes really close to it, I can't really quite tell. So even if it's smudged under very close magnification, it does not detract in any way from the model because you're never going to see it. But the rest of the detail on here, I mean, look at this, all this pipe work at the front of the tanks. What could have been a fairly basic model? Daypol have done anything but, and everything that can be done has been done. I just really can't find any fault to this. And they haven't even skimped on the finish. So, you know, we've got parts picked out in the appropriate colours everywhere. The chimney... Funnel, chimney, funnel. I, don't, I keep getting told off and I can never quite remember the correct terminology. I'm sure it's funnel. I remember from Thomas the Tank Engine, um, Percy getting a pair of trousers wrapped around his funnel as a scarf or something. So I, I, I'll call it both and Yabu sucks to you if you don't like it. Um, but certainly we've got an accurate representation of the, the shape that this particular member of the class carried. Now, I believe that Dapol have tooled up for at least two, possibly more, variations on the funnel, chimney, funnel. And um, uh, these are accurately represented for members of the class at the appropriate times. It's also the case that they've tooled up for, I think, two different versions of the boiler. Now, I'm not an aficionado with the B4 dock tank class, so I, they all look the same to me, but I believe that there are some detail differences which are available across the range. So if you want to uh, repaint or renumber or rename any of these to represent a different member of the class at a different particular time uh, in history, then you probably do need to check up quite carefully, but it stands to reason that Daypol have produced the base model suitable for your renumbering or renaming. Looking below the running plate there, the detail underneath is, again, truly exquisite. Those wheels really do look the business, and I, I really like how Daypol have managed to reproduce what is actually quite a complex shape with the rounded spokes, and then we've got the flat counterweights. Now, these locomotives... They, the fact that they're an 040 belittles the fact that they were one of the most powerful 040s ever made. The reason that they were built as an 040 was to allow them to negotiate ropey track work, but also some very, very tight curves. But you can see that the locomotive has quite an overhang front and back. And this was really because it's 
It's a locomotive that by rights should have been an 060, but because of those requirements of the track work has been built in this form. The connecting rods on there, the side rods, they are so nicely done. They are metal, but they are, you can see there, the representation of the oil uh, caps and the, the shape of the bearings is really nicely reproduced. The actual cross slide there, though, appears to be plastic, as is the piston rod, connecting rod, going into the cylinders. Now, I personally looked at that and thought, mm, not entirely sure about that. But when I've had these running, they do run silky smooth. I've not had any problems with them whatsoever. And my London and South Western Railway uh, number 91, which I've had running actually for quite some time, has shown no adverse effects from having these components made from plastic. So I'm prepared to actually say that actually um, it does seem to work on this occasion. The entire chassis itself is nicely detailed. We've got some bits and pieces in there, sanding boxes, the sand pipes are really nicely done. They're even cut off and profiled at the end to match what the real sand uh, pipes would have looked like. And it really is a nice attention to detail. The brake rigging is factory applied and the couplings are tension lock mini ones and they are self-centering on a spring. And these are actually necessary because of those big overhangs. It does need some degree of give in these couplings so it doesn't just pull wagons off the track on the curves. The buffers are fully sprung and actually there's a good resistance to the spring of those buffers. They do feel like if you're going to use three link couplings those will work really really well. Steps on the side of the locomotive, they're made of plastic it feels but they are pretty robust and again the tampo printing on that is really nicely done. The front face of the locomotive captures that look really well of this kind of dished smoke box but with no other ostensible detail. It looks like it should just remove out to be able to fit a DCC decoder but trust me it doesn't. And this is an area where I have to say that there was a little bit of disappointment but we're going to come to that when I do the DCC fitting guide. The other area that is very uh, characteristic of this class is these big front faces on the cylinders accurately represented by Daypol and then we've also got these wheel guards too for just scooping up and pushing to one side any detritus on the track which could have derailed the locomotive. One of the other things which has become a little bit of a trademark of Daypol steam models is the firebox flicker. On this locomotive it is fitted and it does give quite a pleasing effect but it's not really hugely bright so that will please a number of people who've maybe said you know it doesn't need to be that bright if it's glowing so fiercely that it lights up the inside of the cab really there's some kind of an issue with the way the fireman is firing the locomotive but it is a subtle effect and it's nice to see that manufacturers are making use of some of the auxiliary functions on DCC decoders, even in the steam models. It looks fairly realistic, actually. You can't see the LED that's providing the flicker. It looks slightly random. It isn't actually random. It does run to a set pattern, but the effect is actually yeah, pretty good. So it's nice to see that this has been included in this model. When running on DC, it it works all the time, but as I said, it's not an overpowering effect. So actually, I don't think anybody's going to be too disappointed with that. Right, I'm going to turn now to the DCC fitting guide. And what I will say on this is this is not for the faint hearted. Daypol do do a factory DCC fitted version of all of the different liveries of this locomotive. And if you're not happy with the slightly more involved level of skill required, for doing the DCC fitting, I really do recommend that you just buy the factory fitted example. That said, I am going to show you how to fit a DCC decoder from Trainomatic in this model. First up, getting inside this, you have to be so careful. There are one, two, three, four screws that are very, very obvious there to get inside the keeper plate. And this is an area where 
actually it's come in for a lot of criticism and this is exactly the same for this particular release as the first release so there is no difference between the batches as far as I can tell. Now, I will warn you and I will warn you again at this point. If you make one false move, this locomotive will punish you for it. And it will punish you by dismantling itself. Yes, I, you heard that right. You have to remove this keeper plate. And what you can see there is there is nothing now to stop these wheels from just coming out. If you turn this locomotive the other way up, they will fall out and they will take with it the connecting rods, the cross slide and the uh, pistons. Everything will literally come out from there and you will spend hours trying to get this back together because it is very, very fiddly. Ask me how I know. The couplings you see in there, this one's come out. There's a spring that goes over a spigot and then they just fit into that gap. So we need to take these out and then we can see the screws that we need to undo to get inside this locomotive. There are three of them. This screw here and then these two at the front. This one can be missed. I've seen a few people complain that they missed it and stripped a thread as a result. Just Normally, you see, I'd just turn it over to uh, let these drop out. But as I said before, you really cannot do that with this DCC fitting. It is the most involved. And once I'm inside, I want to show you how I, I just hope that Daypol would take notice and just a minor change on this model honestly would make such a difference. Right, at this stage, it can be a bit counter uh, counterintuitive. We're gonna take the keeper plate and we're gonna put it back on before we turn this locomotive over. So we don't need all the screws. What this is for is quite simply to stop that self-destruction or self-dismantling of uh, the uh, wheels and uh, connecting rods. Now this is a really long-winded process but it now means that we can turn this over and just slide the top off. And we can do this safe in the knowledge that the valve gear and the wheels are not going to fall out and believe me you do not want to let them fall out. Now this has already been fitted with the six pin wired trainomatic decoder. So I'm going to show you this. Inside one side of the model there is a recess in the tank. The six pin decoder fits perfectly. Just push fit into that gap. I'm not going to pull it back out because it's an interference fit. You need the wiring to the front and then on the six pin decoder we get this wiring loom down to the six pin plug. When you take out the six pin blanking plate the numbers for which pin is which are on that blanking plate. Do not pull it out until you've made a note of which side is pin one. FYI pin one is actually this side so where you see the orange wire come down, that side of the plug is pin one. So you need to plug it in that way round. And you can see there, just plugs into that six pin socket on the front. If you get a direct plug six pin decoder, most do not fit because there is not enough room from that plug to the inside of the smoke box door. Now this is an area, I talked to you about this before, if they'd have done a similar method to what they've done with some of the newer models coming through uh, and had the smoke box door just held on with magnets so that you could open it from the outside, there would be no need to dismantle to this stage. You would have immediate access inside to just plug that decoder in. And I really do do hope, Daypol, if you're watching this, please, please, please consider that as a, an upgrade to this model for the next batch. Once we've got that plugged in, we then need to very carefully feed this excess wiring into the front here. I'll just use a small jeweler's screwdriver to feed all of this excess wiring in there out of the way, just so it doesn't get stuck 
underneath and then we push all that in it's quite involved this it's certainly the most involved DCC fitting that I have ever done on a locomotive that was billed as DCC ready you'll feel it go into place it's really difficult to uh, just make sure all that wiring stays put out of the way and there I think I think I've got it the locomotive drops down you'll feel it positively go into place don't force it if you're forcing it it means that the wires are trapped underneath we now need to take the keeper plane back off and I'm sure by now you're watching this and thinking God, you weren't kidding. This really is the most involved ever. And again, don't be complacent because you can still mess it up at this stage and have everything fall out. The next process, once we've got that in, is we need to do these screws. These are the screws that hold the body on. Again, don't over tighten these screws because you'll strip the thread. They're actually going into plastic. Do not get complacent and turn this locomotive over just yet because it can still bite you at this stage. Right, the next step are the couplings. Make sure that they are the right way up for the model. And this is a really hard part. Let's get that in. It really is fiddly. Which is why I said at the start, if you are not uber confident at doing this, then just get the model factory fitted. Simply, I've got the wrong way around. It's simply a case of factory fitted all the way. Don't bother messing about, even if you've got a favoured chip, even you know, if you want to fit sound, don't bother. Just do it like this. And we're in. That is really quite tricky. Then without knocking them, because if you knock them, they might fall out. Keep a plate back in. And then we're oh, final stretch now. The last few screws on the keeper plate. You can see why this is just such an involved process. And it's it's the fact that those wheels and the valve gear could fall out with one false move. And believe me, they are very difficult to get back in. Really, really difficult. And there you have it. Your locomotive is now DCC fitted. It comes time now to do the score for this locomotive. First up is finish. And actually that lining is exquisite. But also the name on the side, the Guernsey, it is so nicely done with so many different uh, aspects to that uh, lettering. It's not just a flat lettering, it has that kind of serif effect on the side as well, and it is just perfectly done. Inside the cab, again, this is the money shot for this locomotive. That really is exquisite in there, with every single individual component picked out in precisely the colour that it should be. There is no compromise on the finish with this locomotive, and it's why I have no hesitation to give this 10 out of 10. Functionality. The locomotive does run pretty well. Uh, once I got it going, it did seem silky smooth, and the haulage capability of these locomotives did seem comparable to what you would have expected from the full-sized locomotives too. So there's a lot of weight over those drive wheels, and it does seem pretty well balanced too. It's also the case that that flickering firebox glow, on DCC you're able to control that using the function keys, and it's a nice extra touch. In all honesty, if Daypol hadn't have included it, I don't think it would have detracted at all from this model, but the fact that they've chosen to add that extra feature shows how much they've gone above and beyond with this model. So for functionality, I'm going to give this a 9.8 out of 10. Next up is ease of use, and this is ostensibly the DCC fitting. 
And it, it's how the mighty fall. It could have been a lot easier. Certainly we've seen with other Daypole models and certainly ones that are forthcoming, they have a really easy method going in through the smoke box door. And you can see with this model on the inside that that would be a possibility. Just minor retooling would allow that to give you direct access to that six pin socket. But instead you have to remove the keeper plate and run the risk of this model dismantling itself. I'm not even going to try and show you that because I know from bitter experience of when I DCC fitted my other B4 dock tank, if you have to try and put that valve gear and uh, all the connecting rods and the wheels back in, it is infuriating. And it just feels that there must have been a better way of designing this model to make DCC fitting a slightly more palatable task. That said, with careful, careful step-by-step -step process, you can do it, but it just feels like you're constantly on a knife edge. Direct plug DCC decoders, most of the ones that I've tried in here don't quite fit. They're a bit too long for the space, so I resolved to use that wired DCC decoder. There are other brands which do do a smaller profile decoder that will direct fit, but all in all, it says to me that really must try a bit harder and I'm only going to give this a 4.2 out of 10. Next up is aesthetics and I'll be honest with you I can't find anything really wrong with this. Daypol have captured the look of the prototype so so well and this is one of the best models I believe for looks in their range. With the new cab design on this to accommodate some of the other members of the class it really is exquisite and Daypol have done an amazing job of capturing the uh, presence of the real locomotive. I've seen some people complain a little bit about how shiny some of the handrails are but actually these locomotives would have been treated with pride by their crews back in the day and it was not uncommon for the locomotive crews to spend every single spare minute polishing and buffing up their locomotives to show the pride that they had in their job and the machinery that they were using. So I think that this is actually a really nice representation of a well cared for locomotive on the docks. So I'm pleased to give this a 9.8 out of 10. Value for money. Again these locomotives they are pushing the £100 mark, but uh, I was able to get this one from Rails of Sheffield for £93.50, so still underneath that £100 mark. And you do get a lot for your money. The locomotive may be small, but the detail level isn't. And this is worth it, even just for that exquisite backhead detail in the cab. All in all, I think that this does offer pretty reasonable value for money. It's a very, very very smooth running locomotive and reliable and I've had no problem whatsoever with this and its stable mate that I got last year and they've they've just run faultlessly and it feels like a locomotive that is going to keep on running and running so value for money I'm going to give this an 8.9 out of 10. That all goes together for a final score of 42.7. It's still a really respectable score and again I just have to give you the proviso. A lot of that score was brought down by the DCC fitting aspect of this model. So if you want it to just run on DC then your quid's in. This is a superb model. And indeed, if you want to go down the DCC route, it just means that you have to be ever so careful. Or alternatively, to be honest, my recommendation for most people is buy it factory fitted. Daypol do every single livery of this model in a factory fitted option. Let them take the pain and then you just have hassle free DCC fitting. I hope this video has been informative to you and don't forget to like this video, share it too and also subscribe to the channel and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up.
Also, don't forget to check out our associated sponsor, Rails of Sheffield, and especially their wanted secondhand trade in service. So, uh, go along, follow the links below, and uh, clear out any items that you no longer want and either clear them in for cash or you can put them in for store credit against something that you really do want. And don't forget to tell them that Jenny Kirk sent you and you'll get an extra 10% on your agreed valuation. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take really great care of yourself. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Judge Mortis, Gary Lewis, and David Quinn. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.